Welcome, welcome to Unspoken Tears. Voice of Men 360 present monthly a session where men and women can get together to share ideas and thoughts and approaches to dealing with mental health, mental health issues, mental well-being. Today, I'm really pleased to be with you uh, with a gentleman from Oregon, the United States. He's presented himself in a way that really is provoking and thought uh, inspiring the mental health comedian, Mr. Frank King. I'm just going to do a quick little disclaimer. If anything that Frank or I say today that might trigger you, please consider yourself uh, fortunate in a way that you have been awaken for a moment to explore new pathways. If you find yourself in a distressful situation, contact us a suicide prevention, reach out to some friends. Nothing of what we're saying today is medical advice. It's sharing stories. Frank is an incredible storyteller. He may provoke and trigger, yet it's from heart. It's from being of service. And I am really pleased to meet Frank today. Mr. Frank King from Oregon, welcome to Unspoken Tears. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks, guys. I, by the way, it's Oregon, uh, <laughs> like a G-U-N gun, not Oregon. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. When I moved here, I found that out very quickly. Us Canadians, we speak a little bit funny times at times. <laughs> so, Frank, share a little bit about the way that you have moved uh, throughout your career and perhaps with a little bit of glimmer of some of your experiences. I, I, when I read your bio, I was quite uh, bemused and uh, quite excited to, to have an opportunity to meet with you. Uh, from perhaps uh, some of your earlier careers to today as part of your repertoire, a mental health comedian. That is correct. I started comedy in the fourth grade. I was, I think, eight years old. I told a joke. The kids laughed. The teacher was hysterical. And so I decided I was going to be a stand-up comedian. At 12th grade, I did the talent show. Nobody had ever done stand-up at the talent show before. I did it and I won. I was going to head straight for L.A. And my mother, big into education, said, no, you're going to college first. She said, I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care. But you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. I went to college, four years of college. And then I moved to San Diego. And just so happens, in San Diego, there was a branch of the world-famous comedy store, the one that's on Sunset. And I went to open mic night on April 1st, 1984. And halfway through my set, I heard a voice in my head say, you're home. And then my second thought was, I'm going to do this for a living. I have no idea how. And if I'd known how difficult it was, I thought about writing a keynote called, what could you do if you didn't know no better? Well, I didn't know no better. So I became a stand-up comedian full time. I said to my wife, I'm sorry, my girlfriend, now my wife of 35 years, I'm going on the road to be a stand-up comedian. You want to come along for the ride? And she, I figured she'd go, oh, hell no. And she said, yes. And so we gave up our apartment, our jobs, stuffed everything we could into my little Dodge Colt. And we were on the road for 2,629 nights in a row, nonstop. No home. Opened up and worked with Seinfeld, Dennis Miller, comics from Canada, Mike McDonald, Norm McDonald, Rosie, Ellen, Dana Carvey, Kevin Nealon, Adam Sandler, Kevin James, back when they were just comics, Dr. Ken the go-to Korean in LA. That lasted until the mid-90s. Then I did a little bit of radio. And after I got fired in radio, which is, there are two kinds of people in radio, people who've been fired, people who are going to be fired. I decided my act is clean. I could do corporate comedy after dinner and after lunch. And somebody asked me, what's the difference between a club comic and a corporate comic? Well, it's about $5,000 a day plus trap. So I'm no math major. I did that until 2007. And then the bottom dropped out of the world economy, you know, the big short. We lost everything in a chapter seven bankruptcy. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. That's okay to laugh. A friend of mine came up after a keynote recently. He said, hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I go, hey, man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? That's where the humor, <laughs> yeah, that's where the humor is in my keynotes. It's not jokes about depression and suicide. It's funny, personal anecdotes. So after the recession ended or wound down, meeting planner said, look, Frank, we love you. We just can't pay you five grand to be funny anymore. You got to teach your audience something. I'm, I, what am I going to teach anybody? So just so happens that I have a friend named Judy Carter. And Judy had a comic magician that wrote a book 
called The Message of You. Subtitles fabulous. Turning your life into a money-making speaking career. So in an effort to go from funny speaker, speaker who was funny, I read the book. I went into it thinking I got nothing. About halfway through, I thought, oh my Lord, I've got something to talk about. Given my family history, there are more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd. Given my close brush with suicide, I thought if I could get some suicide prevention training, you know, some credentials, I could keynote on suicide prevention. Second problem or hurdle was everybody thought I was a funny guy funny guy for two and a half decades. How do I change their mind, prove to them I can do something? My wife suggested a TEDx, of which I now have seven. I famously said, what's a TEDx? She explained it to me. And that week, I got an email from British Columbia, Collingswood. They had a TEDx and they asked if I wanted to send in an application. I did and I got it. I was 52 years old. Nobody in my family, none of my friends, not my wife. Nobody knew I was living with major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. At that TEDx, I came out as depressed and suicidal on stage. And that led to two invitations to more TEDx on mental health. And I've done four more since then. I think I hold the record, the world record. I don't think anybody else has got seven TEDx talks. That allowed me to make the switch from funny speaker to speaker who's funny. I tried to figure out who my ideal clients would be. And I realized there's a top 10 list of occupations at risk for suicide. Starts off with construction, mining, excavation, fishing, farming, forestry, dentists, veterinarians, attorneys, and agriculture. Top 10. So I selected a half dozen of those, and those are the only people to whom I speak. I did four keynotes on Wednesday for a construction company in Omaha. And the reason they had me come out is every year, a 1,000 people die by accident in construction, and 5,000 die by suicide, which means you're five times more likely to jump off that building than you are to fall off. they got a really big problem. So that's my niche. That's my lane. I don't, I've got other speeches. I'll do them if you want them, but I don't market them. I don't push them. I just... I am a suicide prevention speaker and my brand is a mental health comedian, which somebody said to me, does being a comedian keep you from getting the gig? No, 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 you don't understand. They want the lived experience. They want the learning objectives, the outcomes. And if I can make it amusing, they call it comic relief for a reason. It's a dark topic. So that brings you, and I coach TEDx. I've got about 31, 32 TEDx coaching clients that I helped to get land TEDx. So that's, that's kind of where I am today. And in the dark, semi-darkness, because, uh, the generator only powers half the house. <laughs> thank God for AT and T and cell phones. Well, Frank, thank you so for, for, so much for joining us today. The site, the the blackout in Oregon. <laughs> the, your what you just shared <laughs> with people, I believe we ought to cut it out and allow it to be a five step approach that people can move from any career into a speaking career. That was eloquent it was accurate and it was spot on get into your niche to shift the stories to make mm -hmm. your tragic experiences into magic experiences find ways to be humorous with anecdotes about oneself stay in your lane focus on your clients fantastic debrief for any potential speaker anyone who's looking to be on a tedx stage and then it was beautiful also to share that that's something that you are also providing coaching services, mentoring services with. Bravo, that was an excellent beginning chatter about you and your career. So thank you so much. Today is World Suicide Prevention Day. What have you yeah. noticed are two or three of the trends? What are the ways that you're sharing a message that can really serve the people in your audience? Say to them after I give them the statistics that in, the, in North America, one person dies by suicide every nine minutes, around the world every 40 seconds, and hardly anybody talks about it. The good news is, if you mention the words depression and suicide out loud, almost everyone has a story. Eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. Eight out of 10 ambivalent. Nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt, which means the vast majority of people want to be saved. The vast majority of people can be saved. And you can do it by doing something as simple as we're doing right here, and that is starting a conversation if you know how. And that's what I teach my audiences. How to spot the signs and symptoms of depression and thoughts of suicide, what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do, and how to find resources. Because suicide is the most preventable cause of death on the planet. Anybody can stop a suicide. You do not have to be a clinician. You just have to know what to look and listen for, what to say and do, and care. That's brilliant. It's you're making it. You've, you've you've obviously done great research on this. You're also a walking, speaking example of somebody who came very close to committing suicide. Yep. What do we need to do to demystify and and to start those conversations? Because as you say, 
We don't need to go and have years of training. We don't need to become a, a PhD. Ask a question. We can listen. We can care as part of it. So what are some of the myths about suicide that you would like to highlight and perhaps even guide our listeners today on ways that they can communicate in a way that expresses the love, compassion, and care that might assist somebody? Well, let's talk about the myths first. One, there's a myth that should never mention the word suicide in front of somebody who's depressed. And I love the reasoning. It might give them the idea. Suicide, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Trust me, it crossed my mind. Uh, myth number two, <laughs> suicide is someone who dies by suicide. It's a cowardly act. It's selfish. Suicidality is a three-legged stool. One leg is social isolation. Second leg is something called burdensomeness, meaning the person who's thinking about dying by suicide feels like they are a burden to their family, their friends, and the world. So they think the world would be better off without one, out them. Now, that's an irrational thought, but it is, it is almost a selfless thought. You're thinking, you know, these people would be better off without. It's burdensomeness, social isolation, and then you, you've made the decision you're willing to take your own life. Another myth is, people ask me frequently, especially if somebody famous dies by suicide, like Naomi Judd, recently, country singer. They said, you know, why would somebody who has everything to live for want to kill themselves? And my stock answer is, well, you know, from my experience, most people who died by suicide did not want to kill themselves. They simply wanted to end the pain. I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to end the pain. And the example I give, it's hard for people who are neurotypical to wrap their minds around how pervasive a mental illness challenge can be. It's in my DNA. So it's, I, you know, there's no cure. I can treat it. And I've got a self-care plan to help with that. Having mental illness is like that Greek God, who his big sin was, he gave fire to man. And he upset the other gods. So they said, look, here's the deal. Here's your sentence. You're going to have to roll this rock up that hill every day until you can get it over top of the hill. And then you can retire. As you probably know, he rolled it up the hill every day and he get near the top and then uh, roll back down to the bottom. Having a mental illness is a lot like that. Every morning you wake up and there's a rock in the hill. Some days the rock is small and the hill is not so steep. Some days it is a boulder and the hill is Everest. But every day there's a rock and a hill. And what I hope anyone who hears the sound of my voice will be able to do is when they wake up the next morning, they will still be able to move the rock. So those are three myths of, and did you know that three times as many women attempt suicide than men? Men tend to complete because they use a firearm. And in the United States, in North America, eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are men. And the reason construction has such a higher rate, there are a variety of reasons, but one is they're tough men, you figure. And I was raised in the Southern United States. And when I was a kid growing up, I was taught big boys don't cry. Yeah, well, that, that's part of the problem. They don't reach out. You know, that's not what men do. We have to be strong. And, you know, it's not just mental. It's physical. I've had several people I knew of this year who died of prostate cancer. And the reason is, is they did not take care of themselves. They did not reach out for help until they had pain in the lower back. And by that point, the prostate cancer has moved into your bones and you're done. Men, men tend not to take care of themselves in that way because we're tough. I don't need to see a doctor. I've been the doctor for 10 years. I never get sick. That was a guy, I talked to a friend of mine yesterday and he had a friend who just passed away from, he had gone to see a urologist. He, his PSA test spiked. He had his prostate removed and he will live a long life. But the doctor said, you know, the day you came in, I saw two other people. One man, I told him he had four months. One man, I told him he had four years. But other than that, I could do nothing for them. You came in early. So you, you, you know, you manned up, came in early, got the test and you'll live a long life. So yeah, it's not just mental things that men ignore or, you know, refuse to do because they're tough physical things as well. So let's uh, let's do a little call out for men who are over 40 to go get your prostate examined if you haven't done it in the last 18 months. And uh, that might be a, a little red flag for people. Yes. I know Movember, Movember tends to be the month of November to raise awareness of uh, prostate cancer. And it's not that we want you to have prostate cancer, as you were talking about, Frank. It's about having the ability or willingness to have a conversation, perhaps being willing to go into vulnerability to reach out for some support or help. Perhaps have a conversation about male toxicity and the lessons that we've learned that are killing us either quickly or slowly. 
I want to recap your three key myths. One is that speaking about it will actually cause it. Uh, number two, that um, social isolation, the burdensome, being a burden to others, and then men have a, a decision-making process that it's quick to decide. You've got various helpers to commit suicide, yet a key component you did mention is that women are as more likely to actually attempt the suicide it's simply men succeed more yes but what, about have, the but, but, what about the statistics frank like they are probably so understated yet they're so startling of what you said you know, one every uh nine minutes in the north america is committing suicide yet those numbers are probably still understated so again so what are some of the things that we can do as men who care, Voice of Men 360, we want to educate, we want to engage. Uh, what would be, again, a number of tips to assist people who are attempting to get more wisdom, more knowledge, more experience in serving our community, particularly our male community, who often are in their cave, they don't want to come out and even engage in many ways. Is there some ways that you've uh, found or, uh, or, or created to make more conversation readily available well you know what i start off with the audience i go look first of all you have to decide if the person is depressed and then if they don't tell you right off the bat when you ask you have to be able to spot signs and look for patterns so for example they're having trouble sleeping or they sleep too much they having trouble eating or they eat too much. they have difficulty getting out of bed in the morning so they're often late for work or school but seem to rally in the afternoon like an entirely different person and then a big one is they let their personal hygiene go if normally their hair is clean or clothes are washed and you see them over and over and hair's kind of dirty clothes aren't quite so clean it may be because they're having trouble getting out of bed in the morning to run a little wash and take a shower uh the question comes up what do you say when somebody says they're depressed here's what you don't say Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. My favorite friend of mine said to me, you need to choose joy. And I said, unless you're talking about dishwashing liquid, I'm out of luck. It's not a choice. What you do say is, I'm here for you and I mean it. I know you're not lazy or crazy or self-absorbed. I know that mental illness, uh, depression is a mental illness. The good news is with time and treatment, things will get better. I'll take the time. I'll help you get the treatment. And then here comes the difficult part. You have to ask them in no uncertain terms. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Just like that. And if you ask that out loud and they are having thoughts of suicide, the chances that they will actually take their life go down rather than go up when you mention suicide out loud. So let's say they're not forthcoming, but your intuition tells you they're circling the drain. They're thinking about suicide. How would you know? Well, they um, talk about dying and death frequently. You catch them Googling it. If they're artistic in any way, it, it shows up as a theme in their music or their artwork or their writing. They're giving away prized possessions because they want to make sure those possessions go to the people they want them to go to when they're gone. They're gathering the means to die by suicide, whether it's stockpiling medication or buying a firearm. And here's a counterintuitive one, very dangerous. They've been depressed for a long time. Now, all of a sudden, they're happy for no apparent reason. Well, they may be happy because they've chosen time, place, and method, and they know the pain. Here it is again. The pain is coming to an end. Here's what you don't say to somebody you believe is suicidal. You're being melodramatic. You're looking for attention. Nobody who talks about it ever does it. Here's what you do say. Do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, what is your plan? And if the plan is detailed, time, place, and method, you need to do your best to get them to a mental health facility immediately, simply, for an evaluation. And if medication is indicated, then so be it. Now, let's say they're taking meds and they're not working. Nowadays, they have a DNA cheek swab test like Ancestry.com. They take your saliva and they, they try to match your DNA to the, let's say, antidepressant that will work best with your particular metabolism. So there's a lot less experimentation. Go on, doesn't work, taper off. Go on, doesn't work, taper off. And only about a third of people who take psych meds are thrilled with them. The other two thirds, eh, are really bad. So I would, it's a couple hundred bucks in the US. It's probably covered by the Canadian, you know, national health plan. That's what I would do. Now, a psychiatrist and I were talking one day and I said, well, what if they're suicidal, but the plan's not really detailed? What do we do? So we came up with this. I would say, okay, well, tell me, are you going to kill yourself? And if they said no, I would say, okay, 
tell me why not. Make them give voice to whatever is still keeping them here because something's keeping them here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Could be family, friends, pets, religion, who knows? But in the suicide prevention business, they call that a turning point. If you can get them to voice out loud why they're still here, you can leverage that to do your best to keep them alive. So that's the uh, signs and symptoms, the protocol. Yes, and I, and I think it's like NAMI, N-A-M-I in the U.S. Most of what they do is free. So you don't have to have, you know, a lot, a lot of resources to take advantage of a lot of their program. In the United States, NAMI, Nationalized Mental Illness, let's say you have a child who has schizoaffective disorder. NAMI, and I'll bet you in Canada they have the same thing. NAMI has a 12-week course, one night a week, for families who have a, an individual in the family who's struggling with a mental health challenge. And they do it by mental, have one on depression, one on schizoaffective disorder, 12 weeks. And I have a friend whose son is schizoaffective and it was tearing the marriage apart. The family was being blown apart by it. He found the class, took the class, he and his wife, and they're still together two decades later. Young man is not recovered, but he is high functioning and you know he's, he's living on his own. So the, that program probably saved his life and the family. So what I'm hearing is that there are programs sponsored by the government, maybe sponsored by cities and states and provinces yeah. that are helpful. They're just maybe under the guise of, of depression or dealing with schizophrenia or dealing with other types of mental health, yet they could be of great assistance to people who are considering suicide. Yes, and to the families of, of those, you know, the people who love them. I've written, co-written four books on men's mental health with two with Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas and Sarah Gare, MA. And it's, it's, for, it's their anthologies, 12 stories in each book, 12 men. Each one has a different issue, gambling addiction, substance abuse disorder, bankruptcy, divorce. Each one talks about what happened and now what they're doing to cope. And it's a, it's a manual. It, there are exercises and resources. And what we discovered is most of the books are sold to women because they've got a man in their life they just cannot figure out. I, I, the ladies, the two ladies called me. I knew one of them. They got together and decided to do the book. There's originally supposed to be one book. It became four books because so many men came forward, volunteered their issues. And they called me. And they said, look, we're going to make it look like an automobile owner's manual. So maybe guys will actually pick it up. And we want to know, will you make it funny? And will you add the automobile metaphors? And I said, wait a minute, you two ladies are writing a book on men's mental health. Don't you think you might need, I don't know, a man, a man. I said, make me a co-author. Let me voice the books for Audible and I'll make it funny and I'll add the car metaphors. And my favorite car metaphor is, ladies, don't you wish your man had a check engine light on his brain <laughs> and it pops on. So he goes to the mental mechanic, guy puts him up on the, uh, you know, on the lift and comes back into the waiting room and goes, Bob, of course you're depressed. Look at this. You're two quarts low on serotonin. It would be so much easier because we say in the book, if men took care of their cars, like they take care of their brains, they better buy a bus because you'll be walking sooner or later. So, it, but most of, most of the books have been sold to women who are looking to help a man in their life. Where can people get these books, Frank? I might, I might, I want you to give a couple of plugs on ways that people can reach out to you so we can get a, a copy of your book and the name of the books. Uh, what, what, what would that be? Yeah. The book is called, the books are called Guts, Grit, and the Grind. Guts, Grit, and the Grind, a mental mechanics manual. And if you go to my website, The Mental Health Comedian, that's, or as we say down south, The Media, Mental Health Comedian, and put your email address in, you can download a, an MP3 copy of the first book I narrated, um, Unabridged, for free. So that would be your introduction to the, you'll get a free audiobook on a bridge. I narrate it. And I got to tell you, I found a great audio editor in Nigeria through Fiverr and I sent them off my, you know, my raw footage. And when I got it back and clicked and listened to what he'd done to my voice, I thought, damn, I am good. Cause he smoothed so out a, the, you know, the lip. yeah. That, that's another one. Maybe we'll get you to uh, type in the comments, his contact, because people who might be watching today have their books written and they might want to make it into an audio book. So that's another way to, to serve someone in Nigeria, help someone in Nigeria. And a big part of what uh, Voice of Men 360 is always looking to connect with people. Yet your comment about women buying the books is also relevant because 
when we ask people to come in and speak and share on Voice of Men 360, it's been amazing how many people from around the world will, will share their wisdom, their experience, their talent. And the number of men that we're actually reaching is still a challenge because a lot of those guys are, are not necessarily <laughs> Uh, very accessible. They're in their cave and they're, they're actually suffering in their cave. Do you have one or two ways to get more of these guys out of the cave? Well, you know what happens? And this is, uh, you know, I'm doing it on a small scale. My goal is to save a life a day. I spoke to a construction company in Cincinnati in March. I did three or four keynotes on site at a construction site. And I go on stage and I'm vulnerable. And I talk about how crazy I am and the mental illnesses I have. And what that does is gives people permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences. People have told me the most amazing things. People I just met, but I feel like the permission fairy, you know, hey, diversion and suicide, ding. And they tell me, uh, and what I do is I do a general Q and A when I'm done. And then I tell the audience, look, if you got a question you want to ask or a story you want to share and you don't want to do it in front of everybody, I'll hang out another 30, 45 minutes. I'll take them individually. And usually there's one or two, sometimes 10 people lined up. So on my third keynote that day, there's 180 construction workers, mostly men. A couple of guys come up, second guy in line steps up and he's crying so hard he can't speak. So I wait. And when he gathers himself, I said, hey, what's up? And he said, well, I can't sleep. I haven't slept in two days. I work on the fifth floor of the building and I think about jumping off every day. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, in the last year, I've lost three people I cared a great deal about to violence, including my daughter who died in my arms. Now, he's never told anybody, but because I went on stage and I was vulnerable, that's my superpower. I, I got that from Brene Brown. I realized when I read her book, that's, uh, I, was, I was walking the dogs, listening to the book. And when she got to that part, I'm like, oh, my God, that's my superpower. You know, I'm up there. I get choked up and I tell the stories. You see a guy on stage bearing his soul, shedding a few tears, it, it allows other men especially to do the same. So I said, I waved the HR, human resources guy over to our conversation. I said, look, you need to take this young man by the hand, take him to a mental health facility and get him evaluated and probably medicated. And I called the meeting planner last week and the young man had gone with them to the mental health center, gotten medicated. He's still in the job and he's doing pretty well. He's still alive. So that's, but again, you know, it, it's by simply mentioning the words depression and suicide out loud, all, all of a sudden people just, you know, they, they, they emotionally throw up all over you. I've, I've seen it happen over and over and over again. So Frank, I, I thank you so much. And you see what I have in the back. I have this idea of a bridge and the bridge is, is taking people from perhaps isolation to another part of, of San Francisco, for instance. And that's a little bit what we're doing here with Voice of Men is assisting people to have a bridge to a new way of looking at it. That's beautiful what you share, that you're willing to step into vulnerability and then show them how you stepped into positivity or at mm -hmm. least neutrality. And then you invite them without judgment because you're already accepting your pain, your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And that almost gives permission for them to finally get themselves enough care to reach out. Would that be well, accurate? And, yes, and let's take it a step farther. I did a TEDx on mental with benefits, the evolutionary advantages of mental illness, because I kept bumping into mentally ill people who had some other extraordinary abilities. And I thought this cannot be a coincidence. So I did some research, and there are untold numbers of famous, infamous, you know, uh, wealthy. Uh, Bill Gates has, um, uh, what is it? Uh, we have trouble reading because the numbers and letters all roll around on the dyslexia. And, and Elon Musk is obviously nuttier than a squirrel turd. And uh, so the talk starts off like this. What if, what I'm trying to do here is put a positive spin on something that's very negative and drive home the idea that mental illness is not necessarily a singularity, but a duality. Um, mental illness and mental ableness beyond what your peers are capable of. It starts off like this. What if those of us living with a mental illness are not living with a gen genetic mutation, but an amazing evolutionary adaptation? And what if mental illness, as one of my favorite Canadians, Malcolm Gladwell says in his book called David and Goliath, a desirable disadvantage. You would never wish it on anyone. However, it comes to certain advantages. And what if the child 
that yes, you have a mental illness, but here's what they haven't told you yet. You probably have some mental ableness your peers can't touch. It would reduce stigma and bullying and eventually use suicide. And I said to the audience, look, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not broken, that I was made this way. My depression and thoughts of suicide are simply the flip side of my imagination, creativity, and comic ability. I can teach you to write stand-up. I can teach you to perform stand-up. What I cannot teach you to do is process the incoming information the way my brain does. It's just wired differently. And there's a reason when I'm on stage and somebody heckles and I fire back that it leaves a smoking hole where they were sitting. And I'm in a club one night. They're throwing a young woman out who's been very disruptive. She gets to the door. She's really drunk. Door of the club on her way out. She starts turning back to me. Must have heard something sound like her voice because, you know, drunk's her voice activated. And she screams at me, F you. And I shot back, not even for practice. And people came up afterwards. How did you think that up? I go, look, I didn't think it. When you heard it the first time, I heard it. I have no idea where it came from. It came screaming out of the back of my head. But I believe that is part and parcel, the flip side of my mental illness is that creativity, that lightning fast processing that, and there are a lot of mentally ill people who are high functioning and have a lot of other talent. Absolutely. That's, I hope whoever is listening today and at any time was so self-critical of your mental health or mental illness, mental dis-ease, is that the flip side, what Frank just said, might be the uncovering of your superpower. Added compassion, added creativity. Uh, Kobe Bryant, before he passed over, he was working with people who were attention deficit disorder, compulsive uh, individuals, because he knew that those people, if that was harnessed, they could create, they could write, they could sing, they could dance, they could do things that are amazing. So folks, if you're listening today and you've been beating yourself up, because you can't sleep. Maybe that sleep is to release a book or a poem or a song. And that if you can breathe into it, if you can explore mental health, mental wellness, creativity, be a genius, let the genie in us flow. And that's what Frank is sharing with us today. And it's amazing, Frank. I, I love the way that you've shifted. I do have a question, question about, you said it was in your DNA. And I, I, I share a little bit about your belief about that it is in your DNA and it, it will stay with you probably to the rest of your life. And yeah, oh yeah, unless I change out my DNA, uh, although psilocybin will be available in microdoses with therapy on January 1st, and they're doing, they're doing experimentation now in Canada, the Canadian military, because I talked to the number one military doctor in Canada, and they believe, so far, the early results are that the, the active ingredient in magic mushroom, psilocybin, with therapy in microdoses. It will be, it's really good on depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance abuse disorder. And so far, the results show that it's not a patch like an antidepressant. It may actually be a rewiring and a fix. So Frank's going to be in line January 1st <laughs> with my psychiatrist doctor's note. I need some of this. The, uh, yeah. So the, again, about the brain and the special abilities. And again, with kids. What kid doesn't want to be special? Look at Harry Potter. He's half muggle, half human. He's got that weird lightning bolt thing, but he's a wizard. I mean, it, it's almost like he is flawed in certain ways, but he has these other amazing, and I say if you're an adult and you have a child like that, wrap your arms around that ability and encourage it and embrace it, energize it. There have been 30 or 40 Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. are hiring people on the autism spectrum simply because of the one thing they do better than anyone else and paying them handsomely and moving them out of their parents' basement. This idea of shifting autism and the whole idea that when they're autistic, they're going to be dependent on you forever. And, and so many people in the last decade have been allowing that special needs to become the special talents. And yeah. I have a feeling what you're talking about there is that imagine you are a, a tech company and you're looking at metaverse and, and that reality, that imagination. Some of the people who might be diagnosed with an illness or a, a disease can actually be able to experience things in, in different dimensions that can definitely move forward mm -hmm. projects uh, in music, in dance, in creative yeah. expression. And so... Uh, no, in, in business, I've got a friend who speaks on neurodiversity in the work. If everybody in the workplace thinks the same, 
it's not going to be near as creative a workplace as if you have people in there who are neurodiverse. Now, they may not pick up social cues. You know, they may be a little awkward, but they think differently. They see the world different. I believe I'm extremely creative. I, I love writing taglines and, you know, that kind of thing, uh, title, subtitles, whatever. And my process is, I had a friend of mine who needed a tagline. His name's Anthony Metton. And he teaches emotional intelligence, communication, and individuation, all soft skills, soft skills in business. He goes, man, I'm desperate for a tagline. I go, well, let me go sleep on it. So I slept on it, woke up at three in the morning, texted him what I came up with. Texted me right back. He says, first of all, you woke me up. Second of all, did you think of this in your sleep? And I said, as a matter of fact, I did. And then what I wrote for him was Anthony Metton, soft skills, concrete results. In your sleep? It's all part of my mental illness, I'm telling you. It's just the way my brain operates. It's uh, Well, in my DNA, by the way, there's something called generational depression and suicide. And it's in my family. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. And if you're that close to an actual suicide and you're already hardwired for it, chances are, you know, you're going to think seriously at some point in your life, taking your life. And of course I did. Uh, so that's, it's, and I've got a, I've got a, um, clinician friend who has a family it goes back five generations so it's just you know because you can pass trauma generation to generation and certainly you can pass whatever it is that causes depression and thoughts of suicide and uh, we have one cousin who doesn't have high cholesterol and he's not mentally ill and everybody else on that side of the family is and we hate him with a passion the uh, the idea of transgenerational trauma is something that voice of men 360 has definitely been talking about with uh with specific experiences with our indigenous cultures. And so we're doing quite a bit of projects with um, mm. our indigenous cultures in, in, in sharing about the transgenerational trauma. And then as you've been sharing today, having that trust circle, having that opportunity to express, having that opportunity to come out of shame, embarrassment, and perhaps the next stage that I'm really looking forward for us to do is to assist what you've been sharing today is, is to take that story, that narrative of, of being so oppressed and find the superpower from it. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll be able to perhaps assist the transition of people going from that victim to survivor. And I, I think the words have such an important component of being able to, to utilize this. And, and you with, again, as a, as a writer, your, your, and your wit, and the way that you're slowing down the process to get it down to share with people, would you like, I love the idea that you're getting these ideas in the middle of the night and before it might, might have driven you crazy when you're in your twenties or thirties, but now you <clears throat> let me go to sleep. I'll take a nap and I'll come back with a couple of ideas. <laughs> I said, I said that to a client yesterday. Uh, we're, we're talking about her, her, her uh, pitch for her TEDx. We're struggling with the title and subtitle. And she looks at me and she goes, look, sleep on it. She knows well that that's my process. I, 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 a friend of mine called me, he goes, listen, I need a, a tagline for this comedy show I'm pushing toward 55 plus active community. And so I'm in a, at the grocery store. He goes, look, kick your, kick your seat back in your car, put on your guided meditation nap thing and call me in 30 minutes. So I did. I kicked the seat back, put on my MP3. I woke up 29 minutes, called him up and I said, here's your tagline because they're actually going to send the comedians to the community. So nobody has to drive. So I said, how about this? Laugh till you cry. No DUI. He goes, oh man, you got that in a nap? I go, it's just the way my brain works. It's just, you know, I ask it and it delivers. Focus. And this is the thing, uh, people who might be listening to this, this is, we've been able to hear some of Frank's gems on creativity. That one about give yourself an opportunity to go take a 20 minute nap. Don't fight it. Go actually enjoy yeah. it. Ask the universe, go to sleep, yet your homework is write down something after you get up. Like, you know, that's the important part, I think, Frank, is to figure out ways to help people have expressions of their creativity, of their new superpower, to develop it, to allow it to bring a giggle, a laugh. What, again, is the power, again, from a mental health, mental wellness uh, effect of laughter, Frank? I, I have a feeling you might have some statistics or facts on how important laughter is to for mental well-being actually i don't um i've never been a big <laughs> you know uh laughter is the best medicine uh you know laugh therapy what i do know is this is that if you're going to deliver a keynote and you're going to be talking about something like depression and suicide 
very dark, very difficult, uh, lots of stigma. If you can give them some serious piece of business, and then you follow it up with a personal funny anecdote, it makes their brain far more accepting of the next serious piece of business. It's almost like being able to take a breath before the next piece of serious business. They call it comic relief for a reason. That's where I think the power of comedy. Also, in my varied career, when the bottom dropped out of the world economy back in 07, 8, and 9, I needed a job because I didn't have any speaking work. So I being a police officer is on my bucket. So I apply with 12 departments in the state of Washington where you're living. And, and they can't deny you a chance to, to be hired because of your age. If you can pass a physical fitness test, and I did at age 52, I passed it four times, older than anybody else, they there passed it. And, but I had several oral boards. And they would say to me, all right, Frank, what's the connection between comedy and being a police officer? I said, well, one, we're, we're both paid observers. We get paid to notice things and people just walk right by. And two, think about this. When I step on stage, I've got to read the crowd. I got to know where, I got to figure out where they are emotionally. So that whatever I say next, you know, hits home and takes us up from there, not down from there. And I said, for example, I'm in an airport one time and I'm standing under television. The television's got CNN running and, and the plane is delayed, mechanical delay. And everybody's in a bad mood. Everybody in the gate area is in a bad mood. And so I'm standing on the TV and I'm waiting for an opening to break to break the mood and the guy next to me goes hey how do we get this tv turned to fox news loud enough for everybody to hear so loud enough for everybody to hear i yell back well you kill me first and the place explodes in laughter now they're still not happy the plane's not leaving but it changed the mood i said so when you're a cop and you roll up on a situation at a big intersection and people milling about you have got to be able to read the crowd and figure out what, what their temperature is because whatever it is you say first is either going to de-escalate or escalate the situation. And that's the connection between policing and comedy and being able to read. I was coming back through Canada, coming back to the U.S. I stopped at the U.S. Uh, Customs Border Patrol. Nice young man, African-American. His name was Thomas. Last name Thomas. And I, and I love guessing where people are from. It's called uh, Cold Read. A friend of mine who's a mentalist told me. And I pra- I've been doing this just for fun for years. And I found out it's, it's a thing. So Mr. Thomas spoke a couple of words. And I said to him, Mr. Thomas, you're from Georgia. And he freezes. And he goes, I am. But how could you possibly know that? And I said, you're asking the wrong question. And he goes, what's the right question? Why don't you have somebody like me at every port of entry in the United States watching and listening to people? And <laughs> so now he's laughing. He goes, yeah, you know, Frank, <laughs> having seen a demonstration of it. But again, that is just part of my, and by the way, on the, on the waking up and having the idea, I got in the habit of setting an alarm an hour ahead of time from when I had to get up. The alarm goes off. I knock back a double shot of espresso lie back down dark quiet and i think part of the problem with the world today is we don't spend much time alone with our thoughts we have earbuds in constantly so i lie there in the dark and just let my mind wander you know and then i'll see that idea oh there's the tagline and i remember that i you know need to go to the grocery store some you know mundane things but that's that hour because I'm honoring the process with my brain. I'm giving my brain a chance to do what it does best. And then I get up on my day. I do it every morning. And when I take a nap, I lie there for a little while, you know, eyes closed, just letting my mind go where it will, see if something had bubbled up while I was napping. But again, honoring the process. So honor, I honor. I'm not happy that I have these mental illnesses, but, and it doesn't define me, but it is part of me. And, like I said, I believe it's a duality, mental illness, and simply the flip side is mental labels. Beautiful, Frank. That's a, a beautiful message. Uh, I love this idea of, of honoring the process, accepting the parts, integrating the parts, uh, finding the superpowers from what we thought or were taught that was perhaps a weakness or a deficit. Uh, as we bring the close today, a uh, world uh, suicide prevention and awareness. Would you have advice for a young person going through the challenge? And would that advice be different than an elderly person going through the challenge? 
and what would be either the one message or the two messages for those diverse groups? Well, the one message for both would be if you're struggling, get an evaluation, a mental health evaluation with a professional. Uh, and if medication is indicated, take the medication, but if it doesn't work well, do the cheek swab test. Two, I would uh, get a physical, because sometimes physical ailments present as mental health challenges like depression. Three, if you're older and you've been living with us for a while, I know my cycle is three days. My major depressive disorder is about 72 hour cycle. So I know when I start cycling down, it's gonna be about three days before I cycle back up. So I know that. So I, I, used to, I used to say I fight it. I don't fight it anymore because it takes a great deal of energy to fight and you're not gonna win. So what I do is I call it surfing the crazy. I catch the wave and I ride that wave of depression until this, you know, until 72 hours, the wave breaks and I'm back to flying level. The, the challenge for younger people is they haven't been through that cycle that many times. And when you're depressed, you tend to think in the immediate. You know, if it's never gonna be any better than this, screw it, why bother? So you A, have to figure out what your cycle is and B, figure out if there's a trigger. I thought I was a victim of my wiring and chemistry until a friend of mine who's living bipolar all his life said, no, Frank, there's something kicking it off. Now you need to, next time you start spiraling down, look back 24 hours, see if there isn't something that tends to repeat each time you start cycling down. Sure enough, I've got a couple of triggers. And sure enough, if it happens, I start cycling down. So yeah, you're not necessarily a victim of your wiring and your chemistry. There's something kicking it off generally. Uh, I'm hearing this beautiful invitation for people to really explore self-awareness, yet also reach out and build a team around you. A team, it could be a coach, it could be doctors, it could be uh, uh, exercise uh, therapists. It, it, it really is about making some connections and, and allowing you. And, yes. and having a self-care plan. I have a self-care plan. Most of my mentally ill friends are high functioning. I have a self Somebody called me and said, you know, with the pandemic, are you, are you struggling? I go, look, here's the deal. Uh, being a high functioning mentally ill, I've got a self-care plan. Diet, exercise, good night's sleep, meditation, medication. And besides that, I've had two aortic valve replacements, a double bypass, a heart attack. I've got three stents. I have mental illness and I lost to a duck puppet on the old star search. This is not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Frank, uh, it's been a, an incredible pleasure and honor to, to uh, host you today on Unspoken Tears. I, I've laughed so much. I've got a couple of tears flowing off. That my a boy. Here. Thank you so much on behalf of uh, Voice of Men 360, uh, men uh, all around the world who might be struggling at times. Hopefully we brought a giggle or two today and some new logic, some new approaches, new creativity that invites you to see the world differently, uh, especially through the, the comical eyes, the wise eyes of Frank King. Thank you so very much, Karen. Frank, any oh, last word for our audience today? Yes, you mentioned Native, you mentioned Alaskan Americans, Inuit and so forth. They have a higher rate of suicide, as do Native Americans, um, uh, African Americans, because culturally, they're less likely to come out to friends and family. So that's, that's higher risk for those folks. Thank you so much, Frank. Have a great day. This is uh, Unspoken Tears, bringing you World Suicide Prevention and Awareness Day. Dave Rogers signing off. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.